Hi, thank you for joining me today in this training on environmental reviews for continuum of care or COC projects. I'm Liz Zapata, and I'm an environmental specialist in the Office of Environment and Energy here in HUD headquarters. Uh, today, I'm here to talk to COC recipients and responsible entities who are either new to HUD's environmental review procedures or who are struggling to apply those procedures to COC projects. I am going to assume, however, that you're or comfortable with COC requirements and the program generally. We're just going to talk about environmental reviews today. If you've been working with COC for a few years, you might recall that there have been some bumps along the way, uh, but we think we have a really improved process now that should make conducting COC environmental reviews as fast and painless as possible. So today, we'd like to walk you through that process and our recommendations for how to conduct COC environmental reviews. We're going to start with an overview of HUD's environmental review requirements. And this is a really big topic. Uh, usually, we cover environmental review 101 in two or three day trainings. Um, so if you're interested in attending one of those, check our website or talk to your local environmental officer for information on upcoming trainings in your area. Um, but we don't have enough time today to provide a full understanding of HUD's environments review process, um, but we want to have, give you a general idea of not just what you need to do to meet the minimum requirements, but also get an understanding of why we're asking you um, to meet these standards and requirements. Once we've gone over the basics of conducting an environmental review, we'll apply those concepts to COC eligible activities specifically and walk through how to complete an environments review for COC projects. We're going to be condensing a lot of information and a lot of technical guidance into a short webinar, so you're not going to get all the details you need today, uh, but we have a lot of resources available online that you can refer back to later, and we'll tell you how to access all of those at the end. So let's start with a general overview of HUD's environments review procedures and requirements so that in the next section we can apply those principles to COC reviews. So what is an environmental review? Um, an environmental review is the process of taking a close look at a proposed project and evaluating its environmental impacts. This should look both at the potential impacts of the project on the surrounding environment. For example, will it destroy a wetland, reduce the cultural value of a historic property, or increase air pollution? Uh, but it's just as important, if not more so, to consider the effects that the environment will have on the proposed project. For example, when considering whether a site is appropriate for housing, uh, we uh, consider whether it's at risk of flooding, uh, whether the site is contaminated, um, and whether noise levels might be incompatible with residential use. Crucially, the purpose of an environmental review is not just to comply with all of these laws, but to document that compliance and to share the background analysis with the public. The environmental review record is a public document that the affected community has a right to review and comment on. So as I said, the environmental review record is a public record showing that the environmental review was completed. It defines the scope of the proposed project, analyzes all required environmental laws and authorities, and demonstrates compliance with them. It also documents any required mitigation measures or conditions and is signed by all responsible parties. It includes both written analysis and will usually require maps and documentation to back up your conclusions. The National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, requires all federal actions, including any project that receives HUD financial assistance, to complete an environmental review. In addition to NEPA, there are a number of other environmental laws that all federal projects have to comply with. Some of them you've heard of, like the Endangered Species Act or the Clean Air Act, um, and some you might not have, like the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act or the Coastal Barrier Resources Act. And HUD also has its own regulations that describe how HUD projects can comply with NEPA and all applicable environmental laws and authorities. Once an application for HUD assistance has been submitted, environmental reviews must be performed before funds are spent or committed. This means a recipient can sub-award funds prior to conducting an environmental review, but neither a recipient, a sub-recipient, or any of their contractors or partners may conduct any choice-limiting actions. A choice-limiting action is anything that would lock in a particular course of action, such as signing a lease. This is important because the environmental review must have value. If you've already signed a lease before you conduct the environmental review, uh, then it's too late to make a change if you find that the site has elevated no lead levels or is located in a floodway. So at that point, the environmental review has less value. 
So it's really important to start the environmental review as soon as possible to avoid potential delays. It's always hard to say how long it's going to take to conduct an environmental review, because if you've got a good site, the environmental review should be pretty simple and easy. But you never know what you might find. If it turns out the site has significant problems, that could slow down the process quite a bit. So ideally, you want your plans to be flexible when you perform the environmental review so that you can simply reject a problem site rather than getting bogged down in it. These are HUD's environmental regulations. Uh, 24 CFR Part 50 establishes the procedures that HUD follows to comply with NEPA when HUD performs environmental reviews itself. Parts 51 and 55 are a little different. These are regulations that create HUD-specific environmental standards, targeting environmental issues that are of particular concern to HUD. Part 51 concerns noise, explosive and flammable hazards, and airport runway clear zones. Part 55 concerns floodplain management and wetland protection. With Part 58, we're back to procedures. Uh, that part outlines the procedures for units of local, state, or tribal government, known as responsible entities, or REs, who perform environmental reviews for projects using HUD financial assistance. This is a process that's unique to HUD. Instead of HUD performing its own environmental reviews as a federal agency, a responsible entity may take that authority and perform the review at the local, state, or tribal level under Part 58. Only certain organizations, namely units of general, local, state, or tribal government, may act as responsible entities, or REs. Under Part 58, HUD takes a hands-off approach to the environmental review process. Uh, the RE takes full responsibility for conducting the environmental review and ensuring that all projects processed under Part 58 comply with all applicable environmental laws and authorities. The responsible entity's certifying officer, who is usually the mayor or chief elected official, uh, unless it's delegated down through a formal delegation letter, is the party who's legally responsible for the review. HUD is involved in the process just at two phases. First, for certain types of projects, the responsible entity is required to submit Form 701515, or Request for Release of Funds and Certification, uh, to HUD to certify that the environmental review was complete. When this is required, HUD reviews only that form, not the entire environmental review record. If HUD approves the Form 701515, it will respond by giving the responsible entity a Form 701516 authority to use grant funds. Um, the responsible entity's environmental review is not complete until it receives that Form 701516, and we'll talk more about how that works in a few minutes. Second, HUD conducts periodic monitoring to confirm that responsible entities are fulfilling their responsibilities under Part 58, but we don't look at the substance of the environmental review until these scheduled after-the-fact monitoring visits. For many Part 58 HUD programs, like Community Development Block Grants and HOME, the same organization is both the recipient of HUD funds and the responsible entity. However, in other programs, including COC, most recipients are not government entities, which means they cannot act as responsible entities themselves. Therefore, COCs need to find and work with a responsible entity. This should be a unit of government with, la with land use authority over the project location, and it could be a city, county, state, or tribe. Just because a recipient isn't an RE itself doesn't mean it's off the hook for doing environmental reviews. Recipients will need to gather up information on the project and its environmental impacts and give that information to the responsible entity to assist them with the environmental review. So to recap, we have two different procedures for conducting environmental reviews at HUD. Under Part 58, a responsible entity completes the environmental review. Under Part 50, HUD conducts the environmental review. Either way, it's the responsibility of any non-RE recipient to help the responsible entity or HUD to prepare the environmental review by assembling the initial documentation and submitting it to the person responsible for completing the review. There are different ways of defining the steps in the environmental review process, but this is how I look at it. First, you define the project. Then you use that project description to determine the level of review. Once you have the level of review, you know what steps you'll need to complete and which laws and authorities the project will have to comply with. So at that point, you can comply with all, that, uh, with all those laws and authorities. Finally, you'll complete all required steps to finalize the review, including depending on the level of review, potentially providing public notice and getting HUD's approval. Let's start with step one and talk briefly about project descriptions. 
The environmental review is going to be very different for supportive services or tenant-based rental assistance than for new construction or even rehabilitation. We can't get started on the environmental review until we have a clear, complete description of every activity that's going to be part of the proposed project. This is going to be the recipient's role. You need to describe your proposal in as much detail as possible so that the responsible entity can understand the potential environmental impacts. This isn't as simple as just naming the eligible activity. Generally, you're going to need more information than that. Just saying tenant-based rental assistance is helpful, but it doesn't tell the full story. For example, it's common to do repairs between, to a unit between tenants. Uh, will that be a component of your program? Are we talking about routine maintenance, like replacing a broken tile or cabinet as needed, or something that rises to the level of rehabilitation, like a full kitchen remodeling? Also, where will the units be rented? Are they going to be throughout a city or all over a county, or maybe just in one or two neighborhoods? All of this is information that's going to be really important to your entire environmental review. Once you have your project description, you can use that to determine the level of review. This is a decision that has to be made by the responsible entity, or HUD under Part 50, although the recipient could make an initial recommendation. From highest to lowest, our levels of review at HUD are the environmental impact statement, environmental assessment, categorically excluded subject to 58.5, categorically excluded not subject to 58.5, and exempt. So very quickly, for people who like flowcharts, uh, this is an overview of the requirements for each level of review. You can see that as the level of review goes up, the requirements increase. And you can also see that sometimes it gets a little tricky and a project may convert from one level of review to another. The lowest level of review is exempt and categorically excluded, not subject to 58.5 or CENST. These are presented in our regulations as two distinct levels of review, but there's no real difference between them, so we lump them together. Our regulations list many, many exempt and CENST activities at 24 CFR 58.34 and 58.35b, but a lot of the key ones are listed here. These are primarily activities without environmental impacts, like supportive services, planning costs, administrative and management expenses, tenant-based rental assistance without any repairs or rehab beyond routine maintenance, uh, as long as the tenant is free to select their own unit. So if you think your project might be exempt or CENST, make sure to check the regulations um, and make sure that it fits into one of these exclusions. If all of the activities involved in a proposed project are exempt or CENST, then the entire project falls into this category. However, if one or more proposed activities is not listed as exempt or CENST, then the entire project is going to require a higher level of review. For exempt and CENST projects, the environmental review requirements are minimal. You'll just need to ensure that the project complies with the laws and authorities listed in 58.6, which are the National Flood Insurance Program, the Coastal Barrier Resources Act, and airport runway clear zones. Once the responsible entity has documented that the project complies with these three requirements, then the project may proceed. There's no need to issue public notice or to get HUD's approval before committing funds to exempt or CENST projects. So moving on, the next level of review is categorically excluded subject to 58.5, uh, also known as CEST or CADEX. Again, our regulations at 24 CFR 58.35A provide a complete list, but the basic types of projects that fit into this level of review are minor rehab, uh, project-based rental assistance, leasing, and new construction of less than five housing units. If you're wondering if a proposed project is minor rehab, uh, which would be categorically excluded, be sure to check 58.35A3, which lays out the very specific criteria. For multifamily buildings, rehab is categorically excluded if the unit density is not changed by more than 20%, if the building is not converting from one land use to another, for example, from commercial or industrial to residential, and the estimated cost of rehab is less than 75% of the total estimated cost of replacement after rehab. In addition to the three laws and authorities listed in 58.6, CEST projects must also comply with the many more laws and authorities listed in 58.5. Plus, when completing a CEST review, the RE must make a determination about whether the project will require any formal compliance steps or mitigation. 
If not, the project converts to exempt, meaning that the project is treated as if it were exempt and no public notice or HUD approvals are required. However, if any formal compliance steps are triggered, then the responsible entity must give the public notice of the project and submit Form 7015 the request for release of funds and certification, uh, before proceeding with the project. So these are those additional environmental laws and authorities listed in 58.6 or 58.5 that CEST projects will have to comply with. It's a collection of federal laws that apply to all agencies as well as executive orders and HUD-specific regulations. Our next level of review is the Environmental Assessment, or EA. Under NEPA, EAs are essentially the default level of review. Categorically excluded and exempt activities are categorically excluded from NEPA. So if an activity is not excluded or exempt, that means a full NEPA, NEPA analysis is required. Most new construction, demolition, and conversion projects will require a full EA. Uh, and this is also the appropriate level of review for major rehab, which would be any rehab that does not conform to the requirements listed in 58.35A3. Uh, so for multifamily rehab, that would be, um, an EA would be required if the unit density is changed by more than 20%, if the building is converting from a non-residential use, or if the estimated cost of rehab is more than 75% of the total estimated cost of replacement after rehab. EAs must comply with all the related laws and authorities listed in 58.5 and 58.6, and conduct a full NEPA analysis, which we call the EA factors and EA analysis at HUD. As with CADEX reviews, EAs conclude with a finding. The responsible entity must determine whether the project will have a significant impact on the human environment. If not, that's a finding of no significant impact or a FONSI, and the review can conclude there giving, after giving public notice and submitting Form 7015-15 to HUD and receiving the Form 7015-16 in return. However, if the responsible entity makes a finding that the project may have a significant impact on the human environment, then the responsible entity has to complete an environmental impact statement, which is our next level of review. And there are two circumstances where an environmental impact statement, or EIS, is required. First, if an EA concludes that the project may have a significant impact on the human environment, and second, if the project will affect more than 2,500 units or beds, you would jump straight to an EIS without doing an environmental assessment first. Both situations are relatively unusual at HUD, uh, so when it does come up, make sure to reach out to your local field environmental officer for assistance. So just as a reminder, here is a visual representation of those levels of review. Pay special attention to the CEST level, which will normally require notice and a request for release of funds and certification, uh, but may convert to exempt, meaning that those steps are not required. And I didn't mention this before, uh, but it's also possible to make a finding of extraordinary circumstances, which would be the case if a project is unique or precedent-setting, controversial, or has the potential to have a significant impact on the environment. In this case, a CEST review could jump up to an environmental assessment. Now, before we move on to our next slide, uh, take a moment to note the three levels of review that require public notice and request for release of funds and certification. Uh, this is the CEST reviews that do not convert to exempt, as well as all environmental assessments and environmental impact statements. I've referred a few times to giving public notice and submitting Form 701515, the request for release of funds. Uh, these are those requirements. Public notice may be given either by publishing in a newspaper of general circulation in the affected community or by posting for an extra three days in a public building, such as a post office in the project area. After giving the appropriate notice and responding to any comments from the public, the responsible entity and the recipient should prepare and sign Form 701515, the request for release of funds and certification, and submit it to HUD. At that point, there's an objection period during which the public may submit any objections to HUD. And when that objection period is over, assuming HUD does not receive any valid objections, it will complete Form 7015-16, the authority to use grant funds. The environment's review is officially complete, and the recipient may begin expending funds only after receiving Form 7015-16, the authority to use grant funds. This is Form 7015-15, the request for release of funds and certification. It's fairly simple. The responsible entity self-certifies that it properly completed the environment's review. 
And again, HUD does not confirm that the environmental review was completed properly until scheduled monitoring visits to the responsible entity. In the final section of the form, um, the form is signed both by the responsible entity's certifying officer and an authorized officer representing the recipient if there is a non-responsible entity recipient. All right, now that we've gotten through the basics, let's apply those principles to COC specifically. First, the big picture, environmental reviews for COC projects should be fast and easy. Generally, environmental reviews for COC projects require a lower level of review, trigger few laws, are low risk, and can be performed quickly. That's not to say that every COC environmental review will be fast and easy. Since rehab and new construction are eligible activities, we do encounter more complex environmental reviews from time to time. But on average, our goal for COC reviews is to make the process as streamlined and as efficient as possible for rental assistance and leasing. A common misconception is that an RE needs to prepare a new environmental review for every unit every year, and that is not the case. Every unit that's rented or leased using HUD financial assistance needs to be covered by an environmental review. However, not every unit needs its own environmental review. This comes back to the project description. You could define a project as leasing one unit in a particular building, but that would be somewhat inefficient because then every unit would require its own environmental review. It's much easier if you define each project as broadly as possible so that you only have to do fewer individual reviews. For project-based rental assistance, a good scale is to review an entire building or complex in one review. For tenant-based rental assistance, we recommend looking at the entire locality as a whole, and we'll talk more about how that works in a few minutes. It's also not necessary to do a new review every time a lease is renewed, a new tenant moves in, or every year. A good rule of thumb is to revisit environmental reviews every five years to confirm that conditions haven't changed. So working with responsible entities is an area where COC can be very tricky. All Hearth Act programs, including COC, are normally Part 58 programs, meaning that a responsible entity should be responsible for, for performing the environmental review. And as we discussed, only, only a unit of general local government can act as responsible entity. Because most COC recipients cannot act as responsible entity themselves, they need to find and partner with a unit of general local government who can act as the responsible entity. So generally, this will be the local government in the area, but depending on the scale of the project and how much difficulty the recipient has finding a responsible entity, it could be the county or even state. If you're a COC recipient and you don't have a good relationship or any existing relationship with your local government, contact your CPD rep for assistance. They should be able to help you get in contact with the correct office to perform your Part 58 review. In larger cities, there will be an office that's familiar with HUD's environmental review process and requirements, and this should go relatively smoothly. Um, but in small cities and rural areas, the locality may be new to HUD's environmental review process. Uh, still, we think that the streamlined review process that we've designed for COC should make this relatively easy for everyone. Because most COC recipients cannot act as an RE themselves, they need to find and partner with a government entity that will act as the responsible entity. Generally, this will be the local government in the project area, but depending on the scale of the project and how much difficulty the recipient has finding a responsible entity, it could be the county or state. If you're a COC recipient and you don't have a relationship with the local government, contact your CPD rep for assistance. They should be able to get you in contact with the correct office to perform your environmental reviews. In larger cities, there should be an office that's familiar with HUD's environmental review process, um, and this should be a relatively smooth process. But in smaller cities and rural areas, uh, the locality may be new to HUD's environmental review requirements. Still, we think that the streamlined process we've designed for COC is going to make this relatively easy at every level. Because the government entity is not the recipient of HUD funds, they may decline to act as responsible entity. And if an appropriate responsible entity cannot be found, HUD will step in and perform the environments review under Part 50. However, most HUD offices will take the time to try to get a way to get the local government to act as responsible entity, and HUD will require a formal refusal in writing before it will take on environments review responsibilities under Part 50. If, as a COC recipient, you're having difficulty finding an RE, please reach out to your CPD rep or field environmental officer. They will have the relationships needed to get you some assistance. So let's talk about how to translate COC eligible activities into levels of review. 
Uh, remember that the lowest level of review is exempt slash CENST, and there are a lot of COC eligible activities that will fall into this level of review, including supportive services and operating and administrative costs, and tenant-based rental assistance and tenant-based leasing without repairs beyond routine maintenance. Then we have kind of a special level of review just for COC that we call CEST limited scope. These projects are CEST, uh, but because the impacts are so minimal, we've created a special environments review pro uh, format that's tailored to this limited review. Uh, this would be project-based rental assistance, sponsor-based rental assistance, and leasing of office space, again without rehab or repairs beyond routine maintenance. Finally, any project that involves repairs, rehab, construction, or demolition will require either a standard CEST review or an environmental assessment. Uh, and the exact level of review is going to depend on the scale of the project. So you might wonder why tenant-based rental assistance and tenant-based leasing are distinct from project-based rental assistance um, and sponsor-based rental assistance. And the difference has to do with who selects the space, whether it's the recipient or the participant. In tenant-based uh, rental assistance and leasing, the assistance is tied to the program participant, and they can select their own unit. But in sponsor-based and project-based rental assistance, the assistance is tied to the unit rather than the person. Uh, and because the recipient selects the unit, they have more responsibility for ensuring the suitability of that unit and therefore a higher level of review. So this is a flow chart that you probably can't read here uh, that we made to help you when you're working on a COC review. Once you have your project description for a proposed COC project, you can use this flowchart to figure out the appropriate level of review, and it also links directly to the right form to use to complete an environments review for that type of activity. This is available on the HUD Exchange. Uh, you can Google COC environmental reviews, and it should pop right up, uh, and there's a link at the end of this presentation. Anything that involves rehab, demolition, or construction can get fairly complex, and we have a lot of training resources and regular training that gets into how to conduct environmental reviews for those types of projects. Uh, but I'd like to take a few minutes to take a close look at conducting reviews for leasing and rental assistance because our process for those is a little more specialized for COC. First up, we have tenant-based leasing and tenant-based rental assistance, uh, meaning leasing or rental assistance where the participant rather than the grantee selects his or her own unit. These activities are classified as CENST under 24 CFR 58.35 B1 as long as there are no repairs or rehab beyond routine maintenance. Note that that section specifically refers only to tenant-based rental assistance, not leasing, uh, but we treat them the same for the purposes of environmental review. In other words, it doesn't matter if it's called leasing or rental assistance, as long as the participant is free to select their own unit, the activity is CENST. The FY 2015 COC operating instructions had a couple of major changes to the environmental review procedures for tenant-based leasing and tenant-based rental assistance. Um, in case you missed them then, uh, these changes have significantly decreased the amount of time that recipients and REs need to spend on environmental reviews for tenant-based rental assistance projects. Uh, the biggest change is that we encourage responsible entities to conduct one programmatic CENST review that covers all anticipated tenant-based rental assistance and leasing projects for an entire program, uh, meaning all units within a COC. In the past, we were seeing responsible entities uh, conducting individual CENST reviews for each unit, uh, which was time-consuming and unnecessary. Based on this guidance, uh, responsible entities should be conducting one review that clears all tenant-based units throughout the entire COC. Even better, there's really only one federal environmental law that you need to worry about for these types of projects. That's Coastal Barrier Resources, and we'll talk more about that in a few slides. Before we dive in uh, into how to do a review for tenant-based rental assistance and leasing, let's talk about the difference between routine maintenance and rehab. In 2016, HUD distributed notice CPD 1602, which provides guidance on categorizing activities as maintenance for purposes of HUD's environments review requirements. Note that this notice does not affect the definition of maintenance for any program requirements. As a rule, maintenance activities slow or halt the deterioration of a building and do not materially add to its value or adapt it to new uses. So some examples of maintenance activities include cleaning, uh, replacement of appliances that are not permanently affixed to the building, 
protective or preventative measures to keep a building, its systems, and its grounds in working order, and replacing of damaged or malfunctioning component parts of a building feature or system. On the other hand, replacing all or most of a feature or system is not maintenance. Uh, the scale of that project would rise to the level of rehab, which would be CEST. A great feature of that notice is that it provides pages of comparisons of activities that would be considered maintenance uh, compared to activities that would be considered rehab. So if you're not sure if a particular action would be maintenance, the odds are good that you'll find it in this chart. So this is important to define uh, because maintenance activities could be CENST, whereas a rehabilitation activity would be categorically excluded subject to. So it's important in defining the level of review. So turning back to tenant-based rental assistance and leasing, which would be CENST if it's limited to maintenance, um, this is the format we prepared specifically for conducting programmatic reviews for CENST tenant-based rental assistance and leasing. Here you can see the first page of that format, which is hopefully fairly self-explanatory. Uh, you'll need to name the project. That doesn't need to be anything complicated, just a recognizable representative name and provide the names of both the responsible entity and the recipient, as well as the person at the responsible entity who's preparing the review. Uh, note, we ask for state or local identifier. That is an optional field. Just use that if your responsible entity has a filing system that you'd like to keep track of. Next, you'll define the project location. Uh, again, this could be a full city or county or any division that makes sense to the recipient or the responsible entity and works well for your records. Uh, some REs find that it makes more sense for them to break these reviews down into smaller geographic areas. Some will clear an entire city at once. It doesn't particularly matter here. It's whatever makes sense for your project. Uh, then you should provide a project description that describes the scale and scope of the proposal. Again, in this case, it should be limited to tenant-based rental assistance and leasing without repairs or rehab beyond routine maintenance. And if you are proposing any maintenance as part of the project or program, the specific proposed activities should be listed in your project description. We leave the level of review and appropriate citation blank uh, because that's a determination that has to be made by the responsible entity. But as we mentioned, these projects should be CENST under 58.35B1. The next page of this form gets into the substance of complying with the related federal environmental laws and authorities listed in 58.6. Uh, so let's take a quick look at those. Tenant-based activities automatically comply with HUD's airport hazard regulations, so there's no need to take further action, including mapping these projects. Similarly, rental assistance and leasing activities alone do not trigger flood insurance requirements. So although we always recommend flood insurance, it's not a requirement for tenant-based rental assistance or leasing. Now, finally, we have Coastal Barrier Resources Act. This is the only requirement that we really need to worry about um, for COC units. Um, now, for COC units, all of them do need to be outside of the Coastal Barrier Resource System, which can be determined quickly with a mapping tool that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service provides online. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Coastal Barrier Resources Act, uh, this act protects relatively undeveloped coastal barriers along the Atlantic and Gulf Coasts, the Florida Keys, the Great Lakes, and Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, these are particularly vulnerable and volatile sites, so we do want to ensure that we don't put any program participants in these locations. If your COC does not contain any COBRA units, then the project is automatically in compliance, although we do ask that you include a map showing the project location relative to the nearest COBRA units um, if there are any in the state. If your COC contains one or more COBRA units, then the rental units will need to be individually mapped to ensure that they are not in a coastal barrier resource unit. So returning to that form we were looking at, here's how it approaches the related environmental laws and authorities. As you can see, the compliance determinations for airport hazards and flood insurance are filled in for you. Um, and for coastal barrier resources, there are several choices for pre-filled compliance determinations depending on the project's proximity to coastal barrier resources. So make sure you select the appropriate compliance determination for your project location. Uh, when the form is finished, there should not be any red italicized text in it anymore. All right, so that's it for tenant-based rental assistance and tenant-based leasing. Uh, now let's get into the somewhat more complex project-based and sponsor-based rental assistance. Recall that in these types of projects, the recipient chooses the project location, which means they're more responsible for the safety and suitability of the housing units, which is why we require a higher level of review of CEST. 
However, because the environmental review, uh, the environmental impacts are so minimal for rental assistance, we only require a limited scope CEST review uh, for sponsor-based and project-based rental assistance without repairs or rehab. If there are any proposed repairs or rehab, uh, then a standard CEST review would be required. So let's take a look at limited scope reviews. Here again, we've made a special environmental review format for limited scope sponsor-based and project-based rental assistance projects. Of these 16 environmental laws and authorities that CEST projects typically comply with, 11 have been completed for you. So this means that for each building or site, you only have to demonstrate compliance with the remaining five laws and authorities, which are coastal barrier resources, flood insurance, floodplain management, contamination, and environmental justice. And for limited scope environments reviews, we have extensive instructions available on our website that provide step-by-step -step instructions on how to complete the form and comply with all environmental laws and authorities. The first page of the limited scope format is nearly identical to the CENST format. Uh, note that when you define the project description and location for a limited scope review, the scale should be smaller than a tenant-based uh, rental assistance or leasing project. You should still make the scope of the project as broad as possible, but a good scale would be to consider a building or a complex as a whole. Anything larger than that would be a little too complex for this type of review. So try to avoid doing an entire environmental review for an individual unit to avoid making extra work for yourself. This is pretty similar to our format for tenant-based leasing and rental assistance. Uh, for most of the related laws and authorities, we were able to conclude for you that all COC project-based and sponsor-based rental assistance projects are automatically in compliance, and we drafted the compliance determination for you. However, some will require site-specific analysis. For those, we left the compliance determination blank, and the separate instruction document provides information on how to comply. You'll notice that you'll also be asked to indicate whether formal compliance steps or mitigation are required for each law and authority, even those where the compliance determination was written for you. That's because that's a decision that must be made by the responsible entity because it will determine whether the project can convert to exempt. So let's take a look at each of those laws and authorities that you're going to need to work through. Uh, let's start with contamination. All HUD-assisted properties must be free of hazardous materials, contamination, toxic chemicals and gases, and radioactive substances where those hazards could affect the health and safety of occupants. So for COC projects, we require two to three steps to make sure we're meeting that standard. First, all reviews should generate a report of known nearby toxic sites and releases. And this is easy to generate using an online tool created by the EPA called EnviroFax. Second, for buildings with five or more units, you'll need to look at past uses of the site and look for anything that could increase the risk of contamination. This could be as elaborate as a phase one environmental site assessment, but we do not require those for COC projects. A good alternative for this type of project uh, is to look at historical aerial photographs of the site. And these may be available at your local library or planning department. Ask for Sanborn fire insurance maps or other historical maps. And you should go back to at least 1940. You can also just get a history of the site from someone with specific knowledge of its history, like a local historian, an elder in the community, or local planning department. Finally, for all projects, you should discuss any potential adverse impacts or red flags. If you uncover any hazards that could affect the health or safety of occupants, either mitigate those impacts or reject the site. This can be a little confusing and overwhelming, so please reach out to your field environmental officer if you need any help with this analysis. Next, let's take a look at floodplain management, which HUD regulates through 24 CFR Part 55. The first step here is to go to FEMA's online flood map service center and locate the proposed site on a flood insurance rate map or firm. Any site that's located in a floodway must be rejected. Floodways are the part of the floodplain that carries the flow of floodwaters during a flood, and that's where the risk is generally highest, so we do not approve residential properties in the floodway. Next, we can approve projects located in a coastal high hazard area or those areas subject to high velocity waves during a storm only if the building meets certain design criteria. Again, these are unusually dangerous sites, so we strongly recommend avoiding projects in these areas. Now, if the project is in a 100 year floodplain or an area that has at least a 1% chance of flooding in any given year, the eight step decision making process is generally required for leasing or rental assistance in a multifamily building. You'll need, either need to document this process, showing that there are no practical alternatives to locating the project in a floodplain, or demonstrate that the entire building is fully covered by flood insurance to protect the residents from flood loss. 
Ideally, you can save yourself a lot of time and money and take a positive action to improve the safety of your program participants by looking for project sites outside of the floodplain. Here again, you can reach out to your field environmental officer for assistance or refer to our floodplain management website, which has step-by-step -step instructions on complying with Part 55 and completing the eight-step process. Contamination and floodplain management are going to be our biggest environmental concerns when we're looking at leasing and rental assistance projects because we want to minimize the health and safety risks to residents. However, there are three more factors that we'll want to look at as part of a limited scope review. Flood insurance is not required for leasing or rental assistance alone. However, HUD recommends getting flood insurance for all programs, uh, but it is up to the discretion of the responsible entity. Remember, getting flood insurance can be a way to avoid having to complete the eight-step process in some cases. We've already discussed the Coastal Barrier Resources Act, and these same requirements apply here. HUD assistance may not be used for any project in the Coastal Barrier Resource System, and any project located in a COBRA unit has to be rejected. Finally, after completing all of your environmental analysis, evaluate environmental justice. You want to make sure that there are no adverse environmental impacts that could disproportionately affect minority or low-income communities like those assisted by the COC program. If a COC project has unmitigated risks from contamination or flooding, that presents an environmental justice issue as well. So the best course of action is to avoid adverse environmental impacts in the first place. So that's about it for your analysis. Now you just need to complete the few final steps before a limited scope environmental review is complete and you can proceed to implementing the project. First, you'll need to make a finding. If there are no required mitigation measures or formal compliance measures, then the project can convert to exempt and there's no need for HUD approval. Once the responsible entity certifying officer has signed off on the review, you may begin drawing down funds and signing leases immediately. If there are any required mitigation or formal compliance steps, proceed to the notice of intent to request for release of funds. The responsible entity must publish or post public notice, but the recipient should pay any publishing fees. Then, after responding to any comments received, both the recipient and the responsible entity should sign Form 701515, request for release of funds and certification, and submit that to HUD. If HUD approves the 701515, again, it will respond with 701516, the authority to use grant funds. Only after the recipient receives that form from HUD may it begin committing funds. So that was a lot of information, uh, but it's all available in the limited scope instructions. This document provides step-by-step -step instructions on how to complete a limited scope review properly, including how to comply with each of the laws and authorities. I want to add a quick note on HEROES, which is HUD's environmental review online system. In general, we recommend using HEROES for all Part 58 reviews, but COC is kind of the exception to that rule. Uh, HEROES is not compatible with the formats that we made for tenant-based leasing and rental assistance or the limited scope format, so we recommend using those tailored formats for Part 58 COC environmental reviews um, rather than using HEROES. HEROES will eventually become mandatory for Part 58 reviews, and we anticipate, anticipate that switch happening in late 2018 or 2019. So if you're watching this webcast in those years, uh, please check the HEROES website, the link is shown here, uh, for the most up-to-date requirements and recommendations. For any HUD staff watching who complete Part 50 COC reviews, HEROES is the required format for all Part 50 reviews at this time. So you do need to use HEROES uh, rather than the tailored COC formats. That's just about it for today. Uh, before we move on to resources, I just want to leave you with these points. First, in general, a responsible entity should be conducting Part 50 reviews for all COC projects, which requires that the recipient work with a unit of general local government. If, as a recipient, you have any difficulty finding a responsible entity, contact HUD so that we can help. HUD can do the reviews under Part 50, but will do so only after exhausting all possible alternatives. Remember from the last slide, HUD cannot use the streamlined COC-specific formats, so the review will be more time-consuming and a little more complicated if it's processed under Part 50. Next, aggregate your environmental reviews. Make each review cover as broad an area as possible um, so that you're conducting one large review instead of multiple small reviews. For tenant-based rental assistance and leasing, uh, that means conducting one CENST review for the entire program, which means you should be able to complete all your environmental review compliance for the entire COC in five or 10 minutes. For project-based and sponsor-based rental assistance, you should scale your reviews so they clear an entire building or complex rather than individual units. For limited scope reviews, we anticipate that taking about an hour unless there are any issues with contamination or floodplains. 
Finally, make sure to wait to enter into any leases or making any other choice limiting actions until after the environmental review is complete. Failure to do so could result in sanctions from HUD. That's it. Now we'll quickly review a few resources that you can refer to later on if you missed any of that. So this is a good one-stop shop for COC environmental review links. Uh, you can find it at this link or by Googling COC environmental reviews. Uh, first, you can access the flow chart I showed earlier that directs you to the correct level of review and format depending on the activities involved in your COC pro project. Or you can go directly to all the formats from the links below the flow chart. If you'd like more general information, you can access the Office of Environment and Energy's main page on the HUD Exchange at www.hudexchange.info slash programs slash environmental dash review. Um, and you can watch more webinars through our training page here. If those resources don't have what you need, uh, you can come to us with questions. For most questions about COC, you can go through the Ask a Question feature on the HUD Exchange, or you can go directly to your local field environmental officer for help with environmental review questions. So thank you so much for joining me today. I hope that you found this helpful and that you're a little more comfortable completing environmental reviews for COC projects. Uh, please stay in touch and keep letting us know what we can do to help. Thank you.